Hello, brothers and sisters, and God bless each of you. My name is uh, Pastor Tommy Smith of Palmasia Baptist Church, and I'm delighted that you're here with us today as we uh, prepare the sermon for the second Sunday in June 2021, June 13th. And uh, we are just grateful, uh, as always, to be in, in the service of the Lord and studying his word. And the word today is going to come from the book of Deuteronomy, uh, fifth book of Moses, and we're going to be reading from the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. Uh, you know, there's so much going on in our world today that affects all of our lives. And it's uh, verses like this really can give us a way to uh, show us how we can thrive in today's world, regardless of what is going on. And so uh, I'm going to read Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 3, and I'm going to ask you uh, to please join me for a word of prayer uh, after we read. Reading from the New International Version, it reads as follows. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. May God bless the reading and hearing and doing of his word. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the name of your precious son, Jesus, Father, we praise you and thank you for your love and goodness and mercy, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to gather before you and hear your word. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that this is a precious word, Lord God, uh, that it has uh, precious promises in it. I ask that you would help us, Lord, to be receptive, Lord, to hear what it is you have to say, Lord, and be willing to apply this word to our lives. Uh, forgive your people, Lord God, of all sin, and continue to bless us, Lord, and uh, help us, Lord God, to grow in love for you and love for one another. We thank you for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. Uh, speaking today from the theme of a chosen legacy, a chosen legacy. The, der the sermon today is about the steps that God took to ensure that his people Israel would be a leading nation. Uh, in the world of that day. Now, God's plan was to get them to adopt uh, practices and habits that would guarantee their success and that their success <clears throat> would then be passed on to successive generations. Now, God's method of uh, accomplishing this required, were, relied very heavily on the power of culture. Culture is how societies institutionalize and pass on the things that uniquely define them as a people. Uh, all people have cultural practices, all groups have cultural practices, but all cultural practices are not equally effective at allowing their adherents to thrive. Today we're going to look closely at the cultural practices God tried to institute in Israel, and in particular to look to his example to see how we as a people may benefit from the legacy that God meant for Israel. Now when we do this, I hope that what we will see is that the instructions that God gave to Israel for building an enduring legacy will allow us to create a new legacy that breaks the bonds of inequality and exploitation. I believe that these things that God spoke to Israel, if we apply them to ourselves, can help us build a new cultural legacy that breaks the bonds of inequality and exploitation that we've had to live with for so long. Now, um, so this sermon is a lot about culture. It, it, it leans heavily on the definition of culture. There's a lot of ways to think about culture. One, one common definition of culture has to do with uh, people think of it in a, in a positive sense as, uh, as people, certain people are more refined and more quote unquote cultured. Um, that, that, that definition talks about the, the, the customs and the arts, uh, you know, social achievements and institutions of a people and, uh, and of a social group. Now that's, that's one way of thinking about culture. That's actually not how I'm using the term today. I'm using the term today in a more generic sense that talks about the, uh, the ways that people uh, live, the, the, their, their manner of life, uh, the way Wikipedia defines it is like this. Culture is an umbrella term which encompasses the social behavior and norms found in human societies as well as the knowledge, belief, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of the individuals in these groups. And so, uh, and, you know, I, I kind of think of it, for those of you who are tech savvy, I think of it as sort of like the operating system uh, for, of a society. Uh, very, you know how a, a computer uh, has to have, uh, you have to operate it according to the operating system, and, and 
it can run apps and so forth if they're designed for that operating system. But uh, if it doesn't, if something doesn't fit with that operating system, then the computer can't do it. That's kind of how culture is for people. It's sort of the default baseline way that people uh, of a certain group operate. It, uh, the values and the things that they hold dear and that sort of thing. <clears throat> now, and typically these things are passed down from one generation to another based on the preferences uh, of, of those people. And, and, and so they, they kind of define them as a people. It's important to remember that, that in the case of African Americans uh, who live in this country, that process was disrupted. Our ancestors had cultural practices and, uh, and, and things and traditions that they would have liked to have passed on to us. They were not able to pass them on to us when they were taken from their land and brought over here. And when we got over here, uh, uh, slave masters were sure not to allow people to pass on their cultures because cultures are how people define themselves. They're how you uh, give yourself a meaning and identity and so forth. And they didn't want that for us. Uh, that was precisely what they did not want because they didn't want us to be able uh, to, to, to function as a, as, a, as a strong unit. You know, it's interesting to note that, uh, that African Americans are the only people in this country for the, where, where the whole brunt of the U.S. government was based on uh, making sure that we could not function as an autonomous social unit. Uh, other, other groups were, uh, were also uh, treated negatively. I don't want to say that we were the only ones treated bad, but there was a unique uh, attempt to, uh, to undermine uh, the very essence of our, uh, of our humanity. Um, so, uh, but what we're talking about today is recovering uh, lost culture, and, and, and not only recovering lost culture, but defining uh, a, a brand new culture to come up with a different cultural legacy uh, for us, a legacy that's designed to, uh, to direct it at restoring our honor and dignity uh, as a people. Now, uh, God, uh, this is exactly what God planned to use uh, with Israel uh, as he was uh, 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 about to set them free. Now, the words that we read were written, uh, the, the, Moses spoke these words uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is sort of a, a, a pause. It's kind of an editorial comment on, on Israel's history there. They, uh, old, Moses has been with them for the last 40 years during their transition from being slaves in Egypt to being uh, a free people who God wants to uh, have a prominent place in the world. And, uh, and so Moses is talking to them about how to do that. And, uh, and, and the method that God chose to transform uh, this group of former slaves into a leading uh, a, a nation was to uh, have them adopt a culture that would uh, reinforce that in them and, and that, would, that would build that into them. God knew that Israel was being placed in the midst of, a, of, a, of an environment where all the surrounding nations wanted to, wanted to annihilate them. I guess it's not that different from today, is it? Um, but uh, so he, he knew that he had to reinforce them uh, and, and allow them to be strengthened from within so that they could survive uh, that, that kind of onslaught that would be uh, uh, coming against them. And so uh, as, we, as we look at these verses a little closer, we can see how God intended for culture to play a big role in that. And that, uh, and that by, by having certain values and principles, uh, uh, God felt that they would be uh, uh, protected uh, from all of the attempts to undermine them. And that is so important uh, to remember, that, that uh, a, a people can thrive uh, based on the beliefs that they have about themselves, the ways that they view themselves, uh, and, and the, uh, the cultural practice that they have, practices that they have to reinforce those beliefs that they have about themselves. And of course, in the case of, uh, of, of, of God's people, uh, those beliefs were, not, were also about, the, they were about themselves, but beliefs were also about uh, God. So what I wanna do is um, look at these verses a little bit closer. Uh, I want us to see the nuances of how God was working with Israel on this, and then I want us to be able to apply that to us today because uh, these, uh, these same uh, words that uh, apply to Israel can apply to us today. So the first point that I want to make is that it's important to remember the source of these words that are spoken to Israel. Now, uh, I'm going to read that first verse again. It says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws. The Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. It's important that they remember the source of these words because uh, these words didn't just come from people. Uh, you know, when humans give uh, uh, instructions like this, uh, they're coming from speculation, right? Uh, uh, 
I, I admire uh, all the efforts that's been done, uh, people who have studied human motivation and that sort of thing. Uh, but the way humans work is that uh, we come up with, uh, with speculations, we come up with hypotheses, we do experiments to validate that and so forth, and then we learn from the results. Uh, but this is God talking here. And God does not have to experiment about what works for human beings. God is the one who designed the model. He knows all about it. So he knows uh, how to tell human beings to operate in such a way that it will accomplish the goal that he wants. He's not speculating. He's not fishing. He knows precisely uh, what to tell humans to do in order to produce the results that he wants them to have. So it's important for, for Israel to remember that these instructions are from the Lord your God. Now, you know, so they're taking advice from God about how to live. Well, uh, you know, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. It's, uh, there are some places where you want to take advice and some places where you don't. Uh, I mean, any of us, I'm sure, would be happy to take financial advice from Warren Buffett. Maybe not so happy uh, about taking advice from, from that, the, the guy that you know who started and failed five businesses in the last two years. You might want to hold off on that. Uh, it's just like taking relationship advice. Uh, it's one thing to take a relationship advice from a couple that's been married 60 years. It's a different thing to take relationship advice from somebody who's been in five broken relationships in the last two years. So uh, it's important for them to remember that these instructions came from God Almighty, the designer of the model. The second point that I want to make about these verses, in the second verse here, it says, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you will enjoy a long life. Now, I would say that this is, uh, demonstrates a generational focus. So the first thing is that uh, uh, they should remember the source of where these words came from. The second thing is that God had a generational focus when he was talking to them. God was not talking about a flash in the pan. He was not talking about uh, one generation being able to live in a nice house. God was talking about how Israel could be a sustained entity in that region of the world, how they could stand and be a nation <clears throat> that continued to thrive, a nation that continued to excel, a nation that could forever stand as his representative uh, on this planet. And so he was talking about how to give them a, a, a method of sustainable growth that would allow them to continue to thrive. If we look at some of the specific language that God used, he used the term, your children and their children, which demonstrates that he is focusing uh, on a succession here. He is focusing on long-term sustainability. He used the term, a long life. He wants them to have a long life. So that means uh, in the instructions that God gave, and he gave, of course, more than just these three verses, but in the instructions that he gave, there must have been a component that dealt with health, because that's the only way that you can have a long life. And then the third thing is that uh, he, he said that the goal, an explicit goal of this is for them to fear God all of their life. So he wanted them to um, have a spiritual uh, connection <clears throat> to, uh, to what he was saying. He wanted them to be able to incorporate uh, in their life uh, his following uh, from, from the Spirit. But the, the, the main thing that I want to point out about this is that God is talking here um, about uh, a quality of life. He's talking about them having a very good uh, quality of life and being able to live a kind of life that is uh, very rewarding and a life that is very uh, fulfilling uh, 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 to them. And uh, so, so that's my second point here. The first one is remembering the focus. The second one is a generational focus. The third point that I want to make here is that relationship does not overrule regulations. The third verse, <clears throat> and pardon me, <clears throat> the ver third verse that he says here is hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it will go well with you and so that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. This final point is very important. The children of Israel are God's chosen people. Uh, they, uh, they, they have a, a, a relationship uh, with God that goes back multiple generations. I mean, think about if, if you look at their, uh, their pedigree, it began with Abraham. Uh, God calls Abraham the friend of God. Book of Genesis explains how Abraham interacted with God. 
and, uh, and the relationship that they had. And then, uh, and even though Abraham had uh, two sons, uh, Isaac and uh, Ishmael, uh, the relationship continued with Isaac. Uh, God made it clear to Isaac that uh, the relationship that I have with your father Abraham uh, and the covenant with him I am passing on to you. And so uh, uh, it was clear that, that God wanted to maintain this relationship, this special relationship with Abraham. He would continue it with Isaac. And then he went on even further and, and uh, talked to Isaac's son, Jacob, even though Isaac had, again, Jacob and Esau. But it was not Esau who was carrying the promise. It was Jacob who was carrying the promise. And so God made it clear to Jacob that he was the one who would carry the promise of Abraham. And now uh, Jacob has 12 sons, uh, which are we call the children of Israel because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So again, we see that the relationship with God goes back multiple generations. And, and so uh, if anybody is in good with God's family, it's the children of Israel. But you know what? Uh, God does not operate by nepotism. Uh, a lot of us uh, know about nepotism. A lot of us have worked on jobs uh, where nepotism has been at play. Nepotism is when uh, someone uh, gets good favor and good treatment, uh, not necessarily because of their talents and abilities, but because of their relationship with certain people in power. Well, that may happen in the world, but that does not happen with God. Uh, you can't do nepotism with God. Uh, God uh, does not exempt us from following his regulations. And so as much as he wanted to bless Israel, as much as he wanted them to thrive, as much as he wanted them to be positioned to enjoy all of his blessings, he couldn't just give them to him. Uh, God operates a world uh, uh, according to uh, principle and according to, uh, to certain uh, uh, values. And, uh, and, and God does not give anybody an exemption from those things because uh, it is necessary to maintain the peace. That's how God operates the world. Uh, that's how God operates the physical world. And that's how God operates the spiritual world. And so even though family relationships are important and God loves them, uh, but God is not exempting us. Uh, regardless of the relationship, regardless of how much you worship God or your grandmother worship God or, and how, how much you want him, uh, in, uh, in order for our children to continue to be blessed, uh, we have to find a way to pass on to successive generations a commitment to God. So uh, it, is, it is vitally important that, these, uh, uh, that, that following God uh, be something that we incorporate. And so, uh, so I've looked at, 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 at these verses from, from sort of three different perspectives, remembering uh, who it is that's speaking, uh, remembering that God has a generational focus, <clears throat> and remembering that, that we, don't, we, we aren't exempt from his word, uh, uh, we're not exempt from following his regulations. Now I want to talk about how we can apply this by learning from Israel's example. And so uh, this promise that God gave to Israel we should understand uh, that that would work with anybody. Uh, that would work with anybody who chose to follow that example. And so as African Americans, uh, we too can line up and say that we want to follow that example. Now, uh, if, if any of you are, are feeling a little uh, uncomfortable about uh, this message being too political, I want you to think about this. Now, these words came to Moses from God to speak to a specific group of people so that this specific group of people could thrive. Now Moses is not speaking these words to the Amorites. He's not speaking to the Moabites. He's not speaking to the Philistines. He is speaking to the Israelites, the children of Israel, because he wants them to thrive uh, from God. And uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong from God's perspective with a people who have been oppressed and, and been denied uh, the, the free growth uh, to, to look to his word to find a way to strengthen themselves. Uh, nothing could be more preposterous than to think that it's somehow wrong for us to apply these words uh, to our lives. This is exactly why God has preserved these words, uh, to apply them to our lives. And uh, besides, uh, we're not trying to put anybody down. We're not hating anybody. We're simply trying to lift ourselves up, which is only natural uh, for all people to do. And so uh, uh, as, as African Americans, we have endured a, a fairly unique form of suffering in this country. We certainly are not the only people uh, that have suffered. But I don't think I've seen anywhere else the sustained kind of attack against the very nature of our humanity. Uh, you got to work hard to get people in, a, in a, 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 their psyche such that, they are, uh, uh, you, that you can exploit them for multiple generations. And, uh, and this was not a trivial thing. Uh, the full brunt of America's strength was devoted 
to undermining us as a people so that we could be uh, financially exploited and so forth. And so uh, as a culture, we have to develop a culture that throws all of that off and allows us to, to thrive. You know, uh, the sustained attack against us had an effect on us. And I am certain that uh, that, that was at the root of, uh, of, of what Brother Arna Bontemps was feeling when he wrote uh, uh, the poem Nocturne at Bethesda. Uh, Arna Bontemps is a poet from the Harlem Renaissance. And he wrote this poem Nocturne at Bethesda. And there's a line in that poem that is one of my favorite quotes because I think it describes our uh, condition uh, so well. And it, it goes like this, is there something we have forgotten? some precious thing we have lost, wandering in strange lands. Is there something we have forgotten, some precious thing we have lost, wandering in strange lands? And uh, the, the point that I'm sure he was trying to get across uh, is, is the fact that uh, as we have been over here and people have deprived us and, and, and not allowed us to make connections with our home, not allowed us to speak our native, native languages, not allowed us to call ourselves uh, by the names that affirm us. Uh, it's had the effect of, 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 of causing us to wander a little bit, uh, almost like we're walking about in a haze to try to get our, our, our footing. And so, yes, uh, Brother, Brother Bontemps, I think there is something that we have forgotten. I think there is some precious thing that we have lost as we have wandered in this spiritual wasteland. But I think we can get it back uh, by turning uh, to the Lord. And so, uh, uh, you know, what we're striving for here is to find a way to build a, a, a long-lasting, sustainable uh, form of cultural living that would allow us to thrive uh, as a people that would allow us to strengthen ourselves and will allow us to continue to just uh, go on and, and more importantly, to make sure that we can pass this on to succeeding uh, generations. And so, uh, so that's how, that's how uh, uh, this will work and that's why I think it's so important to look at these, uh, these scriptures. I mean, think about it. Uh, all societies have gifted people, but a society can only thrive when they find a way to let their gifted ones thrive, let them be able to do uh, what they can do. And so, uh, so in order for us to, uh, to thrive like this, we've got to change our trajectory and make sure that we uh, find a way to, to, to reinforce and to comfort those people who can be our shining stars. Now, one of the things that's going to be necessary for us to do this, in order for us to have a chosen legacy, in order for us to replace uh, the culture that, uh, that we developed in this country in order to survive, uh, and to replace that with a, a culture uh, that is, is edifying and that builds us up, there are some things we're going to have to let go of. There are, of course, some things we need to keep, but there are some things we're going to have to let go of because some of these things were built at a time uh, when we were constantly being challenged and undermined. And so, uh, so one example of things uh, that are, are not helpful for us that we need to let go of is this notion of playing the dozens, the dozens rather, and putting each other down. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, I don't know if we still do that uh, because I've kind of just taken myself out of, that, uh, out of that environment. But I tell you, growing up, uh, boy, that was big time. That's what we did. Uh, we just, just thrived at it. And I hated it. I, I, I hated to be teased like that, and I hated to participate in it. Uh, uh, these are things that come from uh, a dysfunctional uh, a social environment that we had, a, had to build a culture in to survive. So we had to find ways to, uh, to affirm ourselves when people were, were coming against us. And uh, I don't know how many of you have heard the, the, this, uh, this idea that, that playing the dozens uh, says, is alluding to the fact that, uh, that, that the less valuable slaves were sold by the dozen. And so uh, uh, dozens mean that you were in that, in that low group. Now, that's a horrible thought to even contemplate. I don't know if that thing is true or not. But I do know that we, that is something that we should stop doing. Uh, another thing that, uh, that we're going to have to let go of is the, uh, the gender uh, mistrust that we have. There's a whole lot of gender mistrust uh, in our societies. There's a whole lot of uh, men uh, looking at women and women looking at men wondering, uh, okay, what game are you going to try to run on me now? Where are you coming from? What's your, you know, what, what, what angle do, are you playing here? And, and a lot of the family drama that goes with that, it's not that we're just inherently wrong people. We lived in environments where we were not able to develop family stability. I mean, nobody else had to deal with this. The fact that, 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 that master can come in your slave cabin at 3 in the morning and, uh, and, and, and take, your, take your wife off, that uh, the, the child that you've been uh, hoping for uh, and that you tried, that you know you love, 
could be sold off on the slave block to the deep south and you can't do a thing about it. Nobody has had to live with that level of anxiety. Uh, that produces horrible things in people. We had to find a way to adapt and somehow live with that. And some of the cultural practices that we developed uh, have not necessarily, uh, in, in, a, in a different environment where those forces aren't there, those things are no longer helpful. So we got to be able to let those go. And, uh, and, and other things that are related to that. We have to be able to build a cultural environment that allows us to thrive. And so in addition to letting go of some old things, we need to bring about some new things. And I want to just talk about uh, a few of the, of the new things that we have to bring about. Uh, not so much the nuances of how we develop the culture, but I'm talking about three bedrock ideas, three bedrock values that must be incorporated in what we do. And the first one that I'll say is this. We have to acknowledge and keep in mind and believe that God is real and his operating principles cannot be ignored. Uh, we, we want a lot of good things to happen for us, but we're not following the principles that, that God operates by. And, and, and God does operate by definite principles. After all, brothers and sisters, that's how science works. That's why the world of today is so different from the world of 500 years ago, because humans have learned things from science about how the universe operates. And, uh, and, and the universe operates that way because God commanded it to operate that way. And God has not relaxed those principles and he hasn't revoked any of them. So gravity is still in effect. But the beautiful thing about God's principles is that if you know them well enough, then you can always find a way to thrive. I mean, there's a reason that a 200 ton airplane can fly 30,000 feet in an air. And it's not because they have found a way to exempt the law of gravity. It's because they discovered another law called buoyancy that allows them to be able to do that. And so the spiritual universe also operates according to God's principles. And when God says that, you know, you can't uh, 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 succeed uh, if you are uh, become, uh, if you uh, spread lies, uh, when God says that, uh, that you, your mind needs to be uh, stayed on him in order to main, maintain peace, when God says uh, uh, you have to deal honestly if you want to thrive, uh, those are principles that are just as valid as the laws of gravity and thermodynamics. We have to learn those things and we have to know that we're not going to try to get over and get around stuff. We're going to try to abide by the principles that God has made. There is no form of lasting success that doesn't include abiding by God's principles. The second thing is that what has to be a bedrock principle here is that we have to know inherently in our bones that our people are as good as any other people on this planet. Now all of our time being over here, we have been told to doubt that. We have been told to doubt the ability of each other. We've been told to doubt the ability of black professionals. We've been told to doubt the ability uh, of, of blacks being able to do things. I mean, think about it. Uh, when the Tuskegee Airmen uh, wanted to fly, uh, folks, folks actually thought that black men couldn't handle the rigors of flying. Uh, I don't know why they would think that we are uh, uh, you know, physiologically the same as anybody else, uh, but nevertheless, that's how our society was. And so it took a while for them to get past that. Uh, uh, nowadays, we're doing uh, you know, all, all of those great things. But uh, uh, you know, this society, uh, it took a while for, uh, for them to think that blacks could function as professionals, as doctors, as lawyers. Yeah, think about it. They even didn't think the brothers could play quarterback for a while. Uh, that, to me, that's just the height of ridiculousness. But in, in all these areas uh, that they thought we couldn't do, we've come in and we've done excellently in those areas. And, and that has to keep happening. Uh, we have to uh, not only continue to do well in those areas, but it is my belief that just like there are some areas now that people don't question our ability in, right? I mean, uh, who would think of having an NBA team with no brothers on it? Uh, uh, look at the fields of jazz and other films of music and entertainment uh, that we know uh, that we've made a mark in. Uh, no one exhibits the verbal fluency of people like rappers and, and spoken word artists. Uh, they know that, but what I'm looking forward to is when we demonstrate that same uh, flow and that same flair and that same swag when it comes to physics, uh, high energy physics, when it comes to electronics, when it comes to engineering, when it comes to microbiology, there's absolutely no reason, saints, that we can't thrive just as well in those areas as we do in rap. There's no reason we can't be just as good a physicist uh, as we are basketball players. We just have to believe that about ourselves, take those shackles off and just go ahead and do it. Now my third point is that, uh, is, uh, very critical, our exploitation will only end when we become self-empowered. 
Our exploitation will only end when we become self-empowered. Uh, in other words, uh, we can't wait for other people to be enlightened enough to say, oh my goodness, I've been treating these people bad all this time, uh, let me just stop now. Uh, don't wait for that to happen. It'd be wonderful if it did. Don't wait for that to happen. We need to take whatever steps we need to take to empower ourselves so that we're in a position where people cannot take advantage of you. Because as long as people can, yes, they will. That's just the nature of, a, of unsaved humanity. So, uh, so what we want to do is just make sure that we can thrive. People are going to keep trying to do things to keep uh, holding us back. Look at all of these voting rights laws that are being passed. Now, folks couldn't wait for that Voting Rights Act that was passed in 65 to expire so they could go right back to doing their dirt. People are getting all concerned about that. Now, I think for sure we ought to keep fighting against those laws. They're unjust. They're wrong. We ought to fight with everything that we have to prevent them from happening. But we also need to just keep in mind those laws don't have to stop anybody from voting. We can work around those laws. Look at the people in Montgomery in the bus boycott. Uh, folks used to rely on those buses for getting to work. During the boycott, what did they do? They formed other alternative ways. They, uh, they did carpools. They helped each other out. They babysat for one another. They did things like that. We can do the same thing in voting. If, if, if some community wants to be uh, uh, foolish enough to restrict uh, voting to just uh, once a day or two hours at a time, that's fine. We'll, we'll be right there. We'll carpool from churches. We'll, we'll get together. We will go ahead and we will make it happen because uh, we are able to do so. Fortunately for us, uh, we have the network in place. Uh, for us to do all three of these things and for us to uh, enhance uh, this cultural understanding of ourselves, You know, we are still uh, the most church-affiliated people in this country. Uh, we have a network of structures. Uh, we're not attending as well as we used to, but nevertheless, across this country, we have these houses of worship where we come on a weekly basis to be strengthened. Uh, we're doing it virtually now, a lot of us. But the point is that uh, we can take on these things. We can adopt these behaviors. We can make these changes happen, and we can make different things happen for us. Uh, my brothers and sisters, God wants this to happen. God loves us as much as he loves anybody. He loves us as much as he loves Israel. And God created the, the same instructions that he gave Israel that he put in this book he preserved for us too. There is no reason that these things cannot apply to us. But, but God has, uh, has given us the word. He's laid everything out. But please understand, he cannot walk the path for us. That we have to do for ourselves. And so what I want to encourage each one of us to do is, uh, and this is my challenge for each of us, is to be conscious of the values that we are teaching the next generation and let these values include acknowledging God, respecting our people, and being self-empowered. Let these values that we embrace, that become the core of our cultural practices, let these values include acknowledging God, respecting our people, and being self-empowered. And above all and everything else, let me encourage us to make our peace with the Lord Jesus Christ, the starting point in our new legacy, our new chosen legacy of being uh, thriving and, 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 uh, and uh, just excelling in all things in life is to make sure that we are walking with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, make sure that we are receiving the fullness of God's love because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to ask you to please join me in a word of prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for your love and goodness and mercy. We thank you for your grace. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless your people, Lord. If there's any out there who does not know you, Lord, let them accept you, Lord. And God, please uh, let your people accept this word today and let us move forward in a way that glorifies and honors you. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Go in peace.